Good morning, Lizzie. I, I just finished shopping. Stores are like ovens. Lizzie, what is it? Oh, Mrs. Churchill, do come in. Someone has killed father. <laughs> Where? In the sitting room. I'm glad you're here, Alice. I came as soon as Bridget told me. No. It's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. He's been dead less than half an hour. Where's your sister, Lizzie? She's visiting the Brownells in Fairhaven. Go at once. Ask my wife to send a telegram. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. You must try to miss. Would you like to lie down? Come on, let's go to the parlor. Almost. There you are. Uh, I, I haven't seen your stepmother, Lizzie. Nor have I. Is Abby out? Uh, yes, but I thought I heard her come back. She's probably in her room. There's nobody up back, Miss Lizzie. I looked when I fetched the sheet. Then try up front. She must be in the spare room. Please, Miss Lizzie. Oh, Maggie, do as I say. I'm not going up there alone. Oh, come along, Bridget. I I'll go with you. Come on. You must get some rest. Oh! Oh, no! My wife is sending the telegram. What is it?
today, Miss Ford. Miss Emma? Did you kill father? No, Emma. I did not. No more, Emma. Please, no more. Shh. Dizzy, Dr. Bowen says. But I can't think. I can't think. What is that he's giving me? It's, it's just something to quieten your nerves. But I, mu I must think. I must. I shall. Put all of that out of your mind now. Oh. You never should have gone away, Em. I know. I know, dear. I'm back now. What are we going to do, Em? I've always looked after you, haven't I? Just like I promised Mother. Yes, Em. Well, then, you see? Everything is going to be all right. You just go to sleep now. Yes, Em.
veils. Not even a tear. It was a terrible ordeal. City Marshal Hilliard with instructions for you. Instructions? It's after the family has left the gravesite, both bodies are to be taken to a receiving tomb where the heads are to be removed. Removed? And shipped to Dr. Edward Wood, professor of forensic medicine at Harvard University. By whose order, may I ask? His honor, the mayor. Naturally, the sisters are not to be told. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Uh, oh, yes. I, um, I have a request to make of the family. Please remain inside the house for a few days. It would be better for all concerned. Why? Is someone here suspected? I want to know the truth. Lizzie, please, don't, don't upset yourself. I want to know the truth, Emma. Well, Miss Borden, as much as I regret to tell you, yes, you are suspected. We tried to keep it from her as long as we could. I'm ready to go now. Oh, that won't be necessary. If you're disturbed by the uh, crowds out there, just notify the officer in the yard. That I'm to be a prisoner in my own home? You shall have all the protection the police department can afford. Well, we shan't trouble you any further. Naturally, we want to do all we can to help in this matter. There will, of course, be an inquest, closed to the public, if you prefer. Whatever you wish. Bridget Sullivan. I'm 26 years old and unmarried. How were you addressed in the Borden household? I was sometimes called Maggie, but uh, only by Miss Emma and Miss Lizzie. How long were you in Mr. Borden's employ? Uh, two years and uh, nine months at the time of his death. Did the Bordens keep any other domestic servants? Well, sometimes a, a young man came from the farm to chop wood, but he hasn't been round since, since last winter. Then you uh, and Miss Borden were the only persons in the house the morning of the slayings, aside from the victims. Yes, sir. Now, Miss Sullivan, can you describe the events of that morning from the time you arose? It was very hot that day. I, I, I felt a sort of a dull headache as I got up. It, it must have been the mutton broth from the night before. Mutton broth? Yes, sir. We'd had it five days run. I see. And uh, was Miss Borden also sick that morning? Not at all. At least she, she, she seemed fit enough to me. Morning, Mr. Borden. There's uh, Johnny Cakes or Cookies for breakfast. Uh, which will it be? Johnny Cakes, Cookies. 
appetite for your indigestible Irish starts this morning. Any more of that mutton and broth? Yes, sir. But I suspect it's gone off in this heat. It really wants to be chucked out. It's not fit for human consumption. Well, it's not one, not. Serve it. Mean old stinkent. Watch your tongue. I heard you call him it often enough. Still, it's not your place. I served themselves breakfast, I commenced to wash up. That's when Mr. Barden left for downtown. Did you lock the door after him? Yes, sir, I locked it. M Mr. Barden's very strict about that. When I'd finished my dishes, I took them into the dining room. Mrs. Barden was there, dusting. Where is father? Went downtown. He left while you were upstairs. Oh, Bridget, fetch a pail and some water. I want the windows washed. Today, Mrs. Borden, it's awful hot. Inside and outside, both. They're intolerably dirty. Please, Mrs. Borden. Look, I'm feeling poorly today. Couldn't they wait, perhaps? Stinking smelly cow. I went down into the cellar and got a pail and a brush and went outdoors. I started to work on the north side of the house. Maggie? You going to be out there long? Yes, but you needn't lock the door unless you want to. I can get fresh water from the barn. After a while, Mrs. Kelly's girl came to the fence and I went over to talk to her. But then I went back to my work. There's an awful lot of windows in that house and I had to go to the barn three or four times for fresh water. During all that time, I did, I did not see anybody come to the house until Mr. Borden came home. Is there any mail? None for you. Where's Abby? She had a note and went out. Did she say where? Someone in town was sick, I think. Would you like to take a nap before dinner? After I've read my paper. Sale of dress goods at Sargent's this afternoon, eight cents a yard. Ah, I'm going to have some. But not today in this heat. I feel too ill. Yes, you do look peaked. Oh, why don't you finish those windows later? You can rest before the noon meal. I think I'll do just that.
Then I went upstairs to my room and lay down without taking off any of my clothing. I heard the city hall clock start to strike 11. I must have been there oh, three or four minutes. I, I never went to sleep at all. The next thing I heard was Miss Lizzie hollering, Maggie, Maggie. Up to the time Miss Lizzie Borden told her father about a note which purportedly came for her stepmother, had you heard anything about it from anyone? No, sir. I never had. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor? Uh, the witness is released unconditionally, without bail. She's leaving us, Lizzie. Lizzie Borden to the stand, please. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. Uh, you may begin, Mr. District Attorney. Would you please give the court your full name? Lizzie Andrew Borden. Is it Lizzie or Elizabeth? Lizzie. You were so christened? I was so christened. What is your age, please? 32. Your mother is not living? Uh, no, sir. She died when I was two and a half years old. What was your father's age? He will be 70 next month. He was a successful businessman. He's very successful, yes, sir. Started as a mortician, I understand, then branched out into real estate, banking. That is correct. Do you have any idea how much your father was worth? No, sir. Did you ever know of your father making a will? No, sir. Did he ever mention the subject of wills to you? He did not. Had you been on pleasant terms with your stepmother? Oh, yes, sir. Cordial? That depends upon one's idea of cordiality. According to your idea of cordiality? We were friendly, very friendly. Why did you leave off calling her mother? Because I wanted to. That's the best reason you can give. I have no other answer. In what other respect was your relationship with her not that of mother and daughter, aside from your not calling her mother? She had never been a mother to me in many ways. I always went to my sister because she was older and had the care of me after my mother died. Now, tell me, Miss Borden, on the morning of the murders, did you get your own breakfast? I did not have any breakfast. I did not feel as though I wanted any. Sick from the same mutton broth? It was the heat. question. We are trying to establish if you are certain you were upstairs when your father came to the house on his return. I think I was. Now, you remember, Miss Borden, you told me you were downstairs, not upstairs, when your father came home. You've forgotten, perhaps? I don't know what I've said. I've answered so many questions, and I'm so confused, I don't know one thing from another. I'm telling you, as best I know, I have no one to counsel me. There is no need for counsel. This is only a coroner's inquest, not a trial. You may continue, Mr. Knowlton. Which is your recollection now? Were you downstairs or upstairs when the bell rang and your father came home? I think I was downstairs in the kitchen. You think? Miss 
Borden, we have been over this a dozen times, and each time a new version. Now, how will you have it? I don't know. I don't even know what your name is. I, uh, I think, as nearly as I know, I think I was downstairs. When did you last see your stepmother? When she went up to change the bed in the spare room. And you never saw or heard her afterwards? Until you discovered your father's body? A period of approximately one and a half hours. No, sir. Did you have any knowledge of her leaving the house? She said she had a note. Someone was sick. Did she tell you where she was going? No, sir. Did she tell you who the note was from? No, sir. Did you ever see the note? No, sir. Do you know where the note is now? No, sir. How long was your father in the house before you found him killed? I don't know exactly, because I had to go out to the barn. I don't think he could have been home more than 15 or 20 minutes. And what were you doing in the barn all this time? I needed some lead for a sinker. Did you say a sinker? Yes, sir. I... I was going to Marion on Monday to fish. I needed a sinker. And that's all you did? Look for sinkers? Yes, sir. In the loft. Do you think that would take you 15 or 20 minutes? I ate some pears up there. I asked you to tell me all you did. I told you all I did. I ate my pears. You stood there, eating your pears, doing nothing. I was looking out of the window. Stood there, looking out of the window, eating your pears. I should think so. How many pears did you eat? Three, I think. Now, can you tell us, Miss Borden, why it took you 10 minutes to eat three pears? I do not do things in a hurry. No further questions, Your Honor. It would be a pleasure for this magistrate, and it would doubtless bring much sympathy, if he could say, Lizzie, I judge you probably not guilty, and you may go home. But let us suppose for just a single moment that this is a man before me. Suppose it was a man who was found in the vicinity of the murders. And it was he who discovered Mr. Borden's body. Suppose the only account he could give of himself here was unreasonable, contradictory. Would there be any question what would be done with such a man? So painful as it may be, there is but one thing to be done. It is the judgment of this court that you are found probably guilty. And you are ordered committed to await the action of the superior court. Please forgive me, but I now must ask you a very disturbing question. And I want you to give me a simple yes or no answer. Did you kill your father and Abby? As your family lawyer, I must hear it from your own lips. 
I'm sorry. I am innocent. That's all I need to know. Now, Mr. Jennings, you must tell me. What can I expect? I'm doing everything in my power to... The truth. You have an obligation to tell me. All right. The worst? Death by hanging. But it didn't come to that. Oh, Lizzie! What is it? What is it, Lizzie? What is it? Lizzie! Matron! Send for Dr. Bowen! Matron! Matron! Mr. Jennings has given me his solemn assurance that everything humanly possible is being done for your defense. He's finally retained Mr. George Robinson to assist. It must have been all of the newspaper publicity that attracted him. Imagine it. Our former governor is going to defend you. Must have cost a pretty penny. I've decided to pay for half of everything myself. I can't let you do that, Em. The cost would be ruinous. Even if it takes every last cent of my inheritance. Mr. Jennings said that it might take months to bring me to trial. I don't know if I can stand it in this place that long. I'll be with you, Lizzie. Oh, Em. You're alone now. We have no one. We still have each other. Seems we've always been alone. It's always been harder for you, hasn't it? Why do they speak so coolly of me, Em? Who? District Attorney Knowlton. The newspapers. They call me the Sphinx of Coldness. Why do they want to hurt me like that? Oh, Lizzie. I don't think they mean to. It's just that you're... 
special. And special people have always been misunderstood. You know that? Oh, Em. I don't want to be special. I know, Lizzie. I knew you wanted something special. We got the whole ensemble? Uh -huh. Read it. Oh, Lizzie, we must have gone over this a hundred times. Then we'll go over it a hundred and one. Well, there's your new hat, your navy blue bengaline dress. No! We said the black, remember? The one with the leg of mutton sleeves. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, and your little brooch? The one with the posies. Mm -hmm. It's in the top left drawer of my chiffonier. Oh, and don't forget my six-button black kid gloves. I won't. Mr. Julian Ralph of the New York Sun says he's here for an interview. Oh, gracious, I completely forgot. Give me a moment, will you? You don't mind, do you, Em? I understand your father's estate came to more than a quarter of a million dollars. Only slightly. All these months of legal expenses are fast eating it away. Well, the point is, one can't help wondering why a family of the Borden means didn't enjoy even the simplest convenience of a bathroom. Surely your father could afford more than just a uh, basement latrine. But he wanted to give us all bathrooms. We begged him not to. You see, we had intended to move very shortly to a more fashionable location on the hill. It seemed a, uh, an expensive extravagance for such temporary conveniences. My father was a kind and considerate man, Mr. Ralph. Such stories about him are a vicious slander. You're a most unusual woman, Miss Borden. Difficult to penetrate. What is it like? for a lady of your station, of your sensibilities, to be here in prison. The, um, the hardest thing for me to stand is the night, when there is no light. They will not even allow me a candle to read by. To sit here all the evenings in the dark is very hard. There is one thing that hurts me very much. They say I don't show any grief. Certainly I don't in public. I never did reveal my feelings and I cannot change my nature now. They say I don't cry. They should see me when I'm alone. Yet District Attorney Knowlton urges us to believe that Miss Borden is capable of any cold-blooded deed, even the murder of her father and his wife. Mr. Knowlton goes so far as to call her Sphinx of coldness, not even moved to wear mourning out of respect. But Miss Borden explains it so simply, so honestly. There was not a moment when I could think of such things as hat or dress. Somebody was talking to me all the time about the murders and asking me questions. Now, here's the part that really galls. If people would only do me justice, that is all I ask. But it seems as if every word I utter is distorted and such a false construction placed on it that I am bewildered. There was not a trace of anger in her tone, simply a pitiful expression. Rubbish. Cheap feminist sentimentality. I told you public sentiment would be on her side. Lizzie Borden is a Sunday school teacher, Hosea. 
A devoted worker for temperance, Christian aid, and foreign missions. She is held in high esteem in this community, very high esteem. Mr. Mayor, that woman is a murderess. I hope you can prove that, Hosea. Oh, we'd better be on our way. Can't miss the opening session. Coming, Mrs. Knowlton? I'll be along shortly, Your Honor. You two go ahead. Ah. It's not too late to pull out, Jose. No, sir. Every time I see this case being tried in the press like this, I'm more determined than ever to see Miss Lizzie Borden tried and convicted in the courts. so witless. Well, I'll go back and, and Never fetch mind. The... Never mind. There isn't time. Sometimes I think you actually want to see me hang. That's a very cruel thing to say, Lizzie. Oh, Em. I'm sorry. It's time. They'll not wait any longer. in Salem. Persons having anything to do before the Honorable Justices Mason, Blodgett, and Dewey of the Superior Court for Criminal Business, now sitting at Bristol, draw near. Give your attention and you shall be heard. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Be seated. Now tell us, Miss Sullivan, did you ever have any trouble there in the Borden family? No, sir. A pleasant place to live? Yes, sir, I liked her. And for aught you know, they liked you. I suppose so. You uh, never saw anything out of the way? No, sir. 
Never saw any conflict in the family? No, sir. Never saw anything in the least, uh, any quarreling or anything of that kind? No, sir. Then Maggie is lying. I swear to you, Father. I did not take the money from your desk. That is God's truth. What would she know about the truth? Always making things up, imagining things. Busy till now, I have protected you. I have excused you. I have paid your fines. I have prayed for your soul. I have endured the shame and humiliation as a parent and a Christian. But this is the limit when you steal from your own father. If I did, and I most certainly did not. Would it be any wonder? Will you talk of shame? What of mine when I'm forced to walk down the street year after year in the same old dresses? Oh, listen to her. Spoiled rotten she is. The way we live. Why, well, we can't even entertain entertain properly. Entertain, indeed. Who would you invite? This house. Lord, how I hate this house! No baths, no modern conveniences. Did you know that we are laughing stocks, Father? It's true. Behind your back, people snigger and call you skinflint. That will be enough. I don't understand you, girl. I was always so close. Especially close. Yes, Father. Especially. Then, then why do you behave like this? I'm suffocating. Father, look at me. I'm 32 and practically a prisoner in this ugly old house. Are you perfectly free to come and go as you like? And how far would I get on the, on the paltry $200 allowance you allow me each year? Emma seems to manage. I noticed it didn't keep her from going on the grand tour of Europe two summers ago. Yes. And you'll never get over that, will you, Mrs. Borden? Well, that money was mine. Every penny mine. If you chose to squander your mother's inheritance, you have no one to blame but yourself. Half of Emma's to boot, don't forget that. I'm sure you won't let him. And making Emma sleep in that cramped, stuffy room while her royal highness gets the big airy one all to herself. I never could abide small, dark places, even as a child. Emma knows that. She wanted me to have the big bedroom. Didn't you, Em? Oh, we know all about you and your way, Princess Lizzie. We know how you twist arms and throw tantrums just to get your way. If I were not a lady, I should twist your arm, Mrs. Borden, right out of its side. I will have no more of this. I have warned you repeatedly, Lizzie. One way or another, you will learn not to bite the hand that feeds you if I have to cut you off. You may step down. Call uh, Dr. Bowen to the stand, please. Dr. Seabury Bowen to the stand, please. Dr. Bowen, can you describe what Miss Borden had on that morning? I wouldn't know, sir. It was sort of drab, not much color. It was sort of a morning calico, I should guess. You say it was drab? I merely mean to say that the dress was Answer a the question. Well, if you just wait a minute. No, answer the question. Did it appear to you to be a drab-colored dress? I am telling you, sir, I don't know. I didn't intend to try to describe a woman's dress at the inquest. And I do not intend to now. Well, perhaps you can at least tell us if it was this dress. Your honors, really, this is the government's own witness. I am merely trying to establish whether or not the witness knows what the accused was wearing minutes after the last murder. And if he, a man of medicine, observed any blood on her? The witness may answer the question. 
I should think it was not that dress. Going back to the time, shortly after the discovery of the second body, were you summoned to Miss Lizzie's bedside to administer any medicine? Yes, sir. Miss Russell came to fetch me upstairs, and I gave Lizzie a preparation called bromocaffeine to quiet her nervous excitement and her headache. And did you subsequently administer any other medicines of that kind? Yes, sir. Sulfate of morphine. In what doses? One-eighth of a grain. However, I doubled that the next day. And how long did she continue having the morphine? All the time she was in the jailhouse. In other words, she was receiving regular injections of morphine all the time. Up to her arrest, through the hearing, and while confined in the jailhouse. Yes, sir. Tell me, Dr. Bowen, does not morphine, given in double doses, somewhat affect the memory? change and alter the view of things? Doesn't it muddle the thinking, confuse the mind? Yes, sir. It does cause hallucinations. So that anyone giving testimony while under its influence might tend to seem contradictory to give conflicting stories. Yes, sir. When did you stop giving her this drug? I've not stopped. She's still receiving it. Thank you, Dr. Vaughan. That will be all. No further questions are out. You mentioned uh, that Miss Borden paid a visit to your home on the evening before the murders. That is correct. Can you tell us the purpose of that visit? Lizzie was very troubled. She said that she couldn't help but feel that something sinister was going to happen. Sinister? Yes. She said that her father was having trouble with his business associates and that she was afraid that someone was going to do harm to him. She told me that the barn had already been broken into and all of her pet pigeons had been killed. I tried to reassure her that it must have been some of the local boys up to mischief. But Lizzie felt sure that it wasn't. No! Papa, no! Please! Papa! Why? Now that those young whippersnappers try stealing any more of my pictures and see what they find. But they were mine. Yours? Let me remind you, girl, everything on this place belongs to me. What's mine is mine. And I will dispose of it as I see fit. <laughs> in me that even the house had been broken into in broad daylight when she and Emma and Bridget were at home and as she left she said that she wished she could sleep with one eye open for fear that they would come in the night and burn the house down over the family's head and all this, the very night before the murders? Yes. Was Miss Borden accustomed to making such nocturnal visits to you? Only on rare occasion. And this was certainly a most rare occasion. Now, Miss Russell, 
Can you tell us, please, about the incident which took place the day after the funerals, while you were still staying at the Borden house? An incident involving a certain Bedford court dress? Yes. That was on Sunday. Miss Lizzie, Miss Emma, and I had breakfast together. Bridget was not at home. I went up to the bedroom. And then when I came down, I saw Lizzie standing there with the dress in her hands. Lizzie, what are you going to do? I'm going to burn this old thing. It's covered with paint. Lizzie, I wouldn't do that where people can see me. In broad daylight. Lizzie, there's a policeman in the yard. That is probably the worst thing you could have done. What if they ask us about that dress? Why did you let me do it? Why didn't you tell me? Thank you, Miss Russell. No more questions, Your Honor. Your witness. No questions at this time. This may step down, please. The woman's a fool. She needn't have testified to that. She is a Christian woman, sir. It is the truth. Nonetheless, my dear, we shall nip this in the bud at once. Fear not. May it please your honors, at this time we should like to recall the dressmaker, Mrs. Mary Raymond. Mary Raymond, you say? Yes. I made a Bedford cord dress for Lizzie in about April of last year. Now, Mrs. Raymond, will you please tell the court what became of that dress on the very day that you completed the final fitting at Miss Borden's home? Why, well, yes. The men were painting the upstairs hall and landing. When Lizzie rushed out to show her new dress to her sister, she brushed against the fresh paint. The dress was ruined, of course. Of course. No further questions. Thank you. Now, Mr. Hilliard, can you tell us if this was the hatchet you found in the box behind the chimney in the Borden cellar? It uh, looks like it. The handle was broken like this? Yes, sir, broken up close like that. Mm -hmm. Did you observe anything peculiar about the break in the handle at that time? I did. It was a fresh break, a, a, a new break. Thank you. No more questions, Your Honor. What can I do for you today, Miss Lizzie? Oh, I, I'm afraid I got some paint stains on a perfectly new dress. I would like to buy some naphtha with which to remove them. Do you carry it? Certainly. I'll fetch you some. I imagine a pint will do. Oh, yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Please send the bill. Mm -hmm. Good day. Good day. Miss Borden took something. What? I couldn't quite see, but I'm sure she took something. Doesn't matter. Why didn't you stop her? No need. Old man Borden always pays. Hold all the merchants up and down the street to tack a little something onto the bill whenever happens.
Miss Borden asked to buy 10 cents worth of prussic acid. Naturally, I informed her we did not sell prussic acid unless by a physician's prescription. And what did she say to that? She said she'd bought it several times before. So I says, well, my good lady, not from me. Prussic acid is a very dangerous thing to handle. Did she tell you why she wanted such a lethal poison? I understood her to say she wanted to clean a sealskin cape. <laughs> Order in this court. Your Honors, I must protest the use of such testimony. As part of the defendant's inquest testimony, it is perfectly admissible. I am trying to prove prior intent. Your Honors, may we have a ruling on the admissibility of my client's testimony at the inquest? It was taken at a time when she was under arrest and denied counsel. Will you both please approach the bench? Inadmissible. Every bit of her inquest testimony inadmissible because that fool Judge Blaisdell denied her proper counsel. Terrible, Bluff. Terrible. I built my entire case on her inquest testimony. Now I've got nothing. What about Miss Russell's testimony? That was most damaging. Wasn't it odd that she should come forward on her own like that? Conscience was troubling her, my dear. Seems she neglected to mention the dress-burning incident when the police first questioned her. <laughs> Great stroke of luck. Personally, I don't believe it was that dress. Lizzie Borden wouldn't have been such a fool. Which leaves me still wondering, what did she wear? Nonetheless, I'm sure that the case you've made so far will stand on its own merits, Hosea. Not if Robinson keeps getting our witnesses to discredit their own testimony. He's a shrewd devil, our ex-governor. I trust you have more cards up your sleeve, Hosea. I needn't remind you how much is at stake here. No. One, perhaps. And it had better be a trump card. On August 10th last, at the Harvard Medical School, where I'm professor of chemistry, I received the evidence there exhibited. Briefly, Dr. Wood, can you tell us the results of your examinations? The hair on that hatchet, for example? It did not match the samples of hair from either victim. It is animal hair, probably cow's hair. And what about this dress? Did you not find minute traces of blood on the skirts? Yes, but certainly not from either of the victims. Well, how do you explain that? They are undoubtedly menstrual blood from the defendant herself. Well, let me ask you, Doctor, if this hatchet could have been used and then cleansed so as to remove any trace of blood? No, not by a quick washing, as you've suggested. And it would be nearly impossible to wash blood off that broken end. This is dreadful. There was no time to go over Dr. Wood's testimony. He just got in from Boston an hour ago. No more questions. Your witness? In other words, Dr. Wood, Assuming the assailant wore the same clothing during both murders, he most probably would have been splattered with blood from head to foot. Is that right? In my opinion, yes. And yet every witness has testified that the accused showed no signs whatsoever of blood upon her clothing just moments after the last murder. Thank you, Your Honors. No further questions. Don't make me laugh. Don't make me laugh. Don't make me laugh. Don't make me laugh. You know as well as I, they'd turn me out on the cold if anything happened to you. What more can I do? You can draw up another will. Put everything in my name. Let me see for their needs. It's just enough to grant you a poor defenseless widow. Don't rush things, woman. I'm not dead yet. I'll not be turned out into the streets to starve like a stray dog. She didn't live off her own fat for years. You owe me that much. All right, all right. See my lawyer next week, and I'll have please get some rest. I'll see her dead first. Lizzie, you can.
can spend the rest of your life begging crumbs off that old sow. Not I. Lizzie. Please. You always frighten me when you get like this. He must never make a new will. I'm going to visit the Brownells in Fairhaven. I I'll leave tomorrow. Yes. Yes, you go to Fairhaven. Call Dr. Draper to the stand, please. Dr. Frank Draper to the stand. Were you able to uh, determine the size of the cutting edge of the murder weapon from any of the wounds, Dr. Draper? Not from Mrs. Borden's skull but I was able to effect a conclusion from Mr. Borden's skull. In that case, though I deeply regret it, I shall have to ask your colleague, Dr. Wood, to produce the skull in question. Draper, if you will please try to fit that hatchet into the wound. will be adjourned till nine o'clock tomorrow morning. My dear, I have told you repeatedly I have no stomach for undercooked meat. Let me get you something else. Well, never mind. Lost my appetite anyway. Just some coffee. I shall be glad when this trial is over. It's beginning to tell on you. It's not a trial, it's a sideshow. That woman actually believes she can get off scot-free by hiding behind her skirts. What else has she? I'm sorry, Jose. It's just that it seems to me that you men have only yourselves to blame if, if women hide behind their femininity as a last defense. After all, you cast us in this role. You look upon your womanhood as a role, my dear? It's not always a convenient part to play. I've never heard you talk like this. Next, you'll be asking for the vote. I gather you sympathize with this murderess. She has not as yet been found guilty, Hosea. But you do sympathize with her. Certainly not with her deeds. But perhaps with her motives. <laughs> her motives? Now, what would you know about her motives? I should think a great deal, Hosea. You have no idea how unbearably heavy these skirts can be at times. see the Bedford Court dress? Uh, Sunday morning. I was washing dishes and I turned and saw my sister Lizzie at the stove. And she had the dress in her hands. 
she said, I think I'll burn this old dress up. And I said, yes, why don't you? Or, or something like that. Was Miss Russell present at the time? Yes, sir. And she said afterwards that it was the worst thing Lizzie could have done. And, of course, we knew that she was right, but... It, it just didn't occur to us until that moment. Did your father wear a ring, Miss Emma, upon his finger? Yes, sir, he did. Was or was not that the only article of jewelry he wore? The only article. From whom did he receive the ring? From my sister Lizzie, many years ago. Previously to his wearing it, had she worn it? Yes, sir. It was her favorite. Did he wear it constantly after that? Always. Were the relations between you and Lizzie and your stepmother cordial? Between my sister and Mrs. Borden, they were. When did she cease calling her mother? I don't remember, I... but it was some time ago. Well, prior to that, she had called her mother. Yes, sir, from childhood. Mrs. Borden says you're not to work too late, Papa. Oh, I should have called her mother, Lizzie. She's not my mother. My mother's dead. Still having those bad dreams about your mother? It was a long time ago. Besides, death is nothing to be afraid of, Lizzie. There's nothing more than long, peaceful repose. Do you remember Sleeping Beauty? Well, then, look. Oh. You see how serene she looks? Hmm. Feel. In the flashes. Smooth and cool to the touch. Must be free. Gentlemen of the jury, let me remind you of those touching words. The eyes that cannot weep are the saddest eyes of all. Andrew Borden went to his grave, wearing upon his hand a pledge of love and faith, the ring that belonged to his little girl. To find her guilty, you must believe her to be a fiend. Does she look it? Lizzie Andrew Borton. It is your privilege to add any word which you may desire to say in person to the jury. 
I am innocent. I leave it to my counsel to speak for me. Mr. Foreman, is the prisoner at the bar guilty or not guilty? Maggie? You going to be out there long? Yes, but you needn't lock the door unless you want to. I can get fresh water from the barn.
Upstairs in her room, taking a nap before the noon meal. You're a strange girl to see. A minute is hard and cold as a grave, so next as loving as any father could wish. What say you, Mr. Foreman? Is the prisoner at the bar guilty or not guilty? Not guilty.
Lizzie and Ruth Borsch. The court orders that you be discharged for his indictment and go thereof without delay. Emma! Emma! Dinner will be ready soon, though. Why don't you make yourself comfortable? Didn't you hear me? We're free. At last, we're really free. Nothing to prepare a meal. Now that there are only the two of us. Emma, sometimes I don't understand you. Lizzie. going to ask you this once more and then I shall never mention it again as long as I live did you kill father <laughs> 